It's kind of a response to Corey Anton and Suicide for Celluloids. Uh, question, what is religion? A uh, gigantic question, and I don't think I can answer it in one YouTube video. I guess there's some mention of uh, getting a dialogue or, I don't know, discussion going on this subject. I certainly love it. Um, Suicide for Celluloid broached the subject of the ancient Mediterranean view of religion, uh, which is kind of fascinating in that the gods are sort of others, uh, idealized humans, or perhaps not so much idealized, but exaggerated humans. In an age where if you lost a tooth, it stayed lost, or if you had a scar on your face, um, wasn't much that was, you know, to be done about it, or if you started to lose your hair, there wasn't a great deal you could do, and human beings probably would look to our modern eyes somewhat ugly. Uh, but here's these gods, these idealized humans, which you see so much in uh, ancient Greek and Roman art, uh, perfect physical specimens, and just human beings writ large with all of our appetites and all of our foibles, uh, intensely sexual gods, um, uh, who basically just did whatever they wanted, and that was the cool thing about gods. You're immortal, you're, uh, you're omnipotent, or not necessarily omnipotent. I think only Zeus would could be said to, to have been omnipotent. Zeus or Jupiter. Jupiter. Um, but most of the gods pretty much got away with whatever they wanted to do, unless they angered Zeus, or another combination of gods. Um, there were exceptions, of course, like uh, Dionysus, Bacchus, the god of wine, who would enter into you. Uh, in the form of either wine or just plain inspiration, poetry, drama, the arts, that kind of thing, um, where you could drink wine in the gross sense and get uplifted uh, by intoxication. That was Bacchus, that was Dionysus. Or you could turn to the arts and get uplifted that way. Dionysus was sort of the god of the, the theater. Um, and you could get uplifted by watching a tragedy. You could... Um, see the story of Oedipus, or you could see the story of whomsoever in mythology, uh, and you would feel inspired. You would be transported out of the mundane. So yes, maybe in some ways, or in most ways, the gods were up there on Mount Olympus. And it wasn't so much a question of them spying on your thoughts or anything, but they could do that if they wanted to, but usually they just ignored whatever humans did. It didn't really matter. Um, but again, there were exceptions. Um, Dionysus was sort of more of a modern kind of god in that he would actually enter into you. He was a more personal god. Um, but they didn't really much care whether or not you believed in them. You had to do the proper sacrifices or whatever, but that was about it. You had to show the proper obeisance to the gods. Um, and it was more of a community thing. Uh, it didn't really matter that nobody else believed in your particular in incarnation, I guess, of Athena or Demeter or something like that, um, because that was yours anyways. Uh, it's like the the Catholic version of revering certain saints. It doesn't really matter if nobody else reveres your saint. Uh, in fact, it's probably better that they don't, because that's your thing. So it was a god of community. It was uh, like the Athena Parthenos was the the virgin Athene, who was the patron goddess of Athens, and she became sort of the, the rallying sort of deity of the Athenian people, the Ionian people, a certain branch of the Greeks. And it was, she had a political function, a social function, uh, that kind of thing. A lot of the holidays in the year were centered around her and around Dionysus. Um, but of course, again, the exception being the gods that would enter into you, that would actually enter into your heart and sort of merge with you. Demeter, the goddess of grain, was another one in the form of food, of course. You eat food and you become the god by eating food. There's sort of mirrors of this in the in the Catholic Mass, where you know the body of Christ and they put that on your tongue and that's that. Um, that's the ancient Mediterraneans, and that's kind of interesting in that it differs so profoundly from Christianity, where Christ is seen as a god that is outside and inside you that does care about what you do and what you think and does want you to even feel a certain way. Whereas um, most of the ancient Mediterranean pantheons just didn't care. Just all, all that we want for you to do is to grovel before us. Beyond that, whatever. So what? I don't. You're, you're beneath me. I don't care what you think. Just do as I say. <laughs> um, now, another example of that, another, uh, another ancient sort of tradition of... of um, of polytheism, I guess we could call it, uh, is the one that is still extant today in India, where the 
the pantheon started out pretty much the same way as the ancient Olympian pantheon did, just a bunch of remote gods up there that a priestly caste served as the intermediaries between humanity and these gods. And it was essentially, I would call it, a conspiracy. I believe that the ancient Mediterranean pantheon was something of a conspiracy too, because of course it bolstered the social order. In the same way as the gods were completely unfair and they didn't owe anybody anything and they just did whatever they liked because they were stronger and they were gods, so human relations were ordered in the same way. It's not that, I, that you're my slave because, um, I don't know, you deserve it or something like that. It's just, I'm stronger. You know, I have the, my ability, I have the ability to impose my will upon you. Just the way, the same way as Zeus has his ability to, to impose his will upon other gods and they have the, the ability to impose their will on us humans, etc. I think that the ancient Indian religion, the caste system, Hinduism, or incipient Hinduism, probably started the same way. There's huge controversies around this. But it looks to me as though it was some sort of religious sanction for um, something that would resemble uh, what we called apartheid, <laughs> uh, a nasty system that died about 20 years ago in South Africa, where the white people of South Africa were essentially the, the upper caste, and then there were various gradations of mixed or alternate uh, races of people, and then down at the bottom were the masses of the indigenous black people. Same deal with um, the caste system in India, and Hinduism, at least uh, Vedic Hinduism, started out as just a means of giving that system religious sanction. In other words, uh, there is a case to be made that religion starts out as a conspiracy. But with time, um, let's say you start out with a, with a religion that says that, yes, um, Warriors and priests at the top, merchants uh, in the middle, and um, peasants at the bottom, and anyone who doesn't belong to any of those castes is sort of outside of the whole thing, and any, anyone can do anything they want to them at any time. Those are the modern untouchables. You start off with this, okay? It is a conspiracy. It is a conspiracy to put the powerful and the rich on top. And religion is essentially just a means of bamboozling everybody else into saying that this is the way that the gods want human, you know, society to operate. Well, okay, jump ahead 20 generations. What do you do if the people at the top no longer see that faith that they're in as a conspiracy? What if they actually believe it themselves, that the people at the top, that the system has, as it were, gone on autopilot in much the same way as the world described in Brave New World, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, looks like a conspiracy, but it's simply a machine that's on autopilot. I think the, you know there's an argument to be made that, say, Roman Catholicism took on the same sort of dynamic, autopilot. It started off as a means of bolstering the power of the imperial Roman uh, state apparatus, and now it's an actual faith, and it's lost its original purpose, but it's on autopilot. People still follow it, and they follow the ecclesiastical... Uh, structures and everything like that, and the relationship between the clergy and the state is muted, but it's more or less the same kind of dynamic. It's a force for social control, but it's also, it's no longer identified with the state as such. So Hinduism, I think, went on autopilot as well at some point, and inevitably such things are going to happen as sort of human thinking ossifies. You, you're born into a situation where you see things a certain way, and you assume that that's the law of nature. I think that we all do that when you try and figure out what life is all about. You sort of say, okay, there are castes here. I happen to be in a, a member of a certain caste, and for all, as long as anyone else can remember, this is the way things have always been. You know, there is at least, a, you can understand a tendency for someone, even at the very top, as a beneficiary of the, the conspiracy to, you know, use religion to reinforce an unjust social order. I think that there would be a tendency on people in, in, at all levels of society to assume that that's just the way things are after a certain point, even if it did begin as a conspiracy, as a conspiracy for the people at the top to impose themselves on the on those below, and to have you know saying the gods say that this is the way things should be. Um, so it does look as though, say, the Brahmins or the Kshatriya, the, the warrior and the priest castes in ancient India, did at some point believe that yes things are uh, this way because that's the way the gods made them. They started to believe in their own conspiracy. Um, there's two ways to look at any sort of conspiracy. Do the people at the top know that what they're doing is nothing more than a pile of crap that they're ladling the human, uh, the, the rest of humanity? Or do they actually believe it themselves? The, um, 
you know, the, the, even the modern day conspiracy theorists are divided on that one. Do even the people at the top believe what they're doing? Uh, it, famously in George Orwell's 1984, he solved that one by saying that the inner party simultaneously believed and um, disbelieved their own ideology. They knew that their ideology was complete rubbish, but through the exercise of doublethink, they also believed intensely and fanatically in it. Um, that's an interesting way of looking at things, and I think that it's, I think the human mind is capable of that, to be perfectly honest. Uh, echoes of that in Voltaire's, if God didn't exist, we would have to invent him, because he's saying, well, I don't really, or if God didn't exist, rather, he's sort of opening the, the door to the fact that maybe there isn't a God, but there better be, because we built our entire society on the idea, and if we tamper with that, then the whole thing comes tumbling down. Turns out that Voltaire was right. But anyway, the people at the top, um, start to believe in it, okay? And then, of course, the empty ritual thing. Autopilot tends to be less dynamic, if you ask me. People sort of say, all right, uh, why are we even bothering to do this? Um, there's the famous line from Tolstoy, where uh, Leo Tolstoy saw one of his friends, a Russian Orthodox, sitting down to his meal going like this, just before he ate. And Tolstoy said, oh, you still do that? That was the end of the guy's religious faith. <laughs> All you had to do was point out to the guy that he crosses himself before every meal, and, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. And then he stopped doing it for the rest of his life because it was meaningless to him. But he just did it because he himself was on autopilot. That's what you do before you sat down and ate. So, again, it gets empty, even though it is on autopilot, and it's no longer a pure conspiracy. Uh, in other words, the people at the top and the people at, at the bottom are just going along with it because that's the way things have always been. Now, this creates problems because people sort of start to say, look, we're living a pretty darn empty existence here, and along come people like, I guess, the Buddha, Mahavira, um, Socrates, or whatever, uh, and they sort of challenge this. They say, look, w w is this all there is to life? Is to follow these empty rituals? Uh, to, to sort of, you know, go along with all of this? To just sort of keep doing this pointless sort of... Um, ritual, it doesn't really mean anything or go anywhere. Uh, they see society for what it is, an intensely unequal society, and they sort of say, all right, I think that there's got to be more to life than this, and more to existence than this. Um, and then you start getting, you know, the metaphysical questions coming up, and people asking, what's the purpose behind these rituals that we do? What, what does all of this mean? They don't question the doing of the rituals, though. But they sort of say, what, you know, if we're going to do these, shouldn't we do them for a reason, rather than that's just what we do? And, you know, you, you get you get reform movements like Buddhism, I guess, and then Hinduism, or Hinduism reformed itself. Uh, like some people will say that the Bhagavad Gita, the closest thing the Hindus have to a Bible, uh, was a revolutionary work, and some people say it's reactionary, and I think it's a combination of both, because it served to bolster Hinduism against the inroads of Buddhism and Jainism, and it also served to completely revolutionize Hinduism from the inside. Uh, prior to the Gita coming, around, coming along, or the school of thought that led to it, the Brahmins were the only, um, the only intermediary between the gods and men. There was no other way, and the only thing that you could do to, to communicate with the gods in any way at all was sacrifice or ritual. Had to have a priest for that. The Gita says, if you offer God a bowl of water with the proper spirit, in a spirit of faith, reverence, etc., God will treat that as far more of a gift, far more valuable of a gift than 500 oxen, or I don't know, uh, offered by a priest whose heart is not pure. God will not necessarily accept that Brahmin's Sacrifice. It's kind of like Jesus saying, uh, you know, the, the poor widow's contribution is more important than the rich guy's at the temple. Um, you can't just do this stuff uh, with nothing in your heart. And uh, if, if, if you don't actually believe in it, if you don't actually have faith, if you don't actually have virtue, if you don't actually have a pure heart or whatever, then, then this is meaningless. So the Gita sort of said... Uh, you've got to believe in it. You've got to um, be humble. You've got to be um, 
that the, the overt forms really aren't that important. The overt forms have to be maintained, but inwardly, you've, you're, it's what you actually think that's important. In other words, the, the gods are no longer just the pantheon up there. Uh, the gods are now coming down inside of you. Krishna is now an intensely personal god that each individual person has a relationship with directly. You may still need Brahmins to officiate at the sacrifices and stuff like that, but your relationship to God has completely changed from going through the priests to going to the, uh, to now a face-to-face -face sort of thing. Um, so you've got that. Um, and then you would have, I guess, beyond that, you'd have, you know, people like Shankaracharya later on that would intellectualize the whole thing, sort of like Thomas Aquinas. They would sort of say, look, um, we need uh, we need to actually deal with awkward questions when people start asking metaphysical questions. We have to actually come to terms with the fact that people are asking these things. So they would say, okay, let's just take all the, the scriptures as they read, and we'll sort of translate them into terms that are um, consistent with the latest science or the latest social trends or whatever. Uh, Hinduism has an enormous capacity to reinvent itself. Now, we've gone, say, from a conspiracy to a living faith, as described in the Gita, or as uh, we would um, imagine Shankaracharya, the, the, or Ramanuja, I guess, the two great Hindu philosophers, to have transformed Hinduism into a more proactive, a more active, participatory sort of faith. But uh, India is a huge country, and these, the, these developments can't really be, have been said to have taken place uniformly throughout Indian society, and there are plenty of places where they wouldn't even have touched, where you'd still have empty ritual uh, carried out by rich priests over masses of peasants blinded by religion and superstition. So religion, in many ways, stayed a conspiracy in these places. And, um, you know, it's, again, you can, you can say then that after a while religion becomes a conspiracy again, when everyone looks around and says, what is all this? This is crap. Um, Nehru, who was kind of dismissive of his own faith, if you could call it his faith, I think he might have been an atheist, I'm not sure. He said, um, in, re in reality, Indian society is anarchy. You can say whatever you want in religion or faith or philosophy or any other uh, area of thinking, but you must obey the laws of caste. You don't have to believe any of it, but our society is so structured that if you don't obey the laws of caste or respect them at least, society will simply disintegrate because religion suffuses our society to such a great extent that you simply can't take it out, um, or else everything will disintegrate. And it's kind of like the way that Nietzsche sort of said that we as a society, you know, the God is dead thing, we don't really believe in God anymore, but if we just sort of <laughs> go on with that, if we go on with the idea that God is dead, but continue to, on our, on our present path, we'll, you know, we, we will have hit a nihilistic dead end that will sort of kill us as a, as a civilization. Uh, we have got to reinvent everything. We've got to start from the very beginning and examine our morality and our ethics and everything like that and start again, or else we, we're on the... Uh, we're headed for a big train wreck in our ethical system, our social system, because it's all based on Christianity, and we don't believe Christianity anymore. <laughs> um, and again, that's Nehru. He's saying, look, we've got to at least sort of go along with this, because we don't really have the capacity to, you know, do anything else unless we reinvent our entire society. And then, of course, it starts to look like a conspiracy again, because... You say, okay, well, we know that this system is BS, but we can't really replace it with anything else, so we'd better just go along with it simply because there's no other alternative. Then it is completely reactionary. <laughs> you're not saying that the system is good. You're just saying that, okay, we've got no other choice but to go along with things the way they are because if we try anything else, we tamper with the basic structure, then the whole thing will come tumbling down. Voltaire again, predicting that. Um, if God didn't exist, we'd have to invent him. That sounds like a conspiracy, doesn't it? Uh, you know, again, you full circle. Starts out as a conspiracy, becomes a living faith, becomes a living faith that sort of uses philosophy and science and everything to suffuse the entirety of the civilization. Then people start to to question the the whole, and then they start to say, okay, this is really all a pile of crap, but we can't really tamper with it because society will disintegrate. In other words, it's a conspiracy again, but it's a conspiracy of people who 
are born into a system that they originally believed in, as opposed to just creating a system that they didn't believe in for their own convenience. They were born into a system that they didn't believe in, and it did serve them, and they don't know what to do now. That's the dilemma of decaying upper classes throughout history. Well, the caste system in India has just a gigantic capacity to reinvent itself, and of course it's, it's, it's survived. It's survived all the questions that have been placed to it. It's under uh, strain now, but not fundamentally. I think it's one of the most enormously successful um, successful experiments in uh, social engineering in human history. Um, now, interestingly, uh, I mentioned that one of the things that brought sort of Hinduism back to the mass of the Indian peasantry was the Gita, whereas uh, religion had been just empty ritual uh, lorded over by the priests. Um, the Bhagavad Gita says, no, 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 they, they sort of swept all that away, at least psychologically or philosophically, and they said, no, no, there's you and there's God, that's it. Uh, Professor Anton and um, Suicide for Celluloid mentioned the other. In the dualistic, um, the Dvaita uh, strand of Hinduism, there is only one other, it's God. Uh, there is us, this, this sort of monistic blob of humanity, and then there is God, the other. Uh, Professor Anton mentioned love of the other, and love of the other is essentially what the Gita is all about. It's saying you must love God, because ultimately there is no other other but God. Um, like a lot of Indian traditions are purely monistic, and they say that even that is kind of an illusion, but um, the Gita being sort of a populist document, or sort of populist uh, idea, sort of says, no, no, we need, people want to believe in the other. People, like that, it seems to be inherent in our view of things, that we are dualistic. Um, and love and the other are essentially what the Gita is a handbook on how to do that, how to love the other, how to love God, because God being the only other that there is or can be. Uh, and it spawns the, the the form of Hinduism called bhakti, which is probably the most uh, prevalent in India today, and if anything is gaining in terms of percentages uh, uh, in its hold on the Indian population, the Hindu population at large. It's when you just chant mantras, you sing songs to God, you pray before idols, you go through rituals, etc. Um, but it's all based on devotion to God, and God is sort of the ultimate other. That's the main thing. God is the other. Love of the other is what it's all about. It even transcends what you do and think in this world. Um, as long as you love the other, as long as you love God, and God is shown to be above all things, far more than being powerful, far more than being just, far more than being um, eternal, God is shown to be an intensely lovable uh, being who loves humanity and sincerely desires humanity to love him back. Um, it's an interesting sort of parallel to that, to the, to the idea of love and the idea of loving the other. Um, dualism in its purest form, I guess. There is only God and there is not God. Um, in the Gita, we're sort of led to a first-person identification with Arjuna, who is a prince, a Hindu prince. But we are Arjuna. The, the, the whole thing is put together that way. And Krishna uh, is lecturing Arjuna on how to love him, how to love Krishna. But we are Arjuna, and Krishna is God. And uh, we are humanity, and Krishna is the other. Everybody's other is Krishna. And... Above all other things that we must do, we must love God. Even if we're bad people otherwise, love God first and foremost, more than anything else. Um, gigantic subject turned into an insane ramble that I don't think anyone is really going to go this far in, but it's it's a subject that I absolutely adore. It uh, It's one of the favorite things that I, can, I, I could go on for hours. And I get the sense in Suicide for Celluloid's uh, video and in Corey Antone's video that there's so much in there that you seem a little bit rushed. We seem a little bit rushed and confused when we're talking about it. Hopefully, this will start a will spark a a discussion that might go somewhere. 